everyone, and welcome to this Oxford Union online event with Martin Tyler. My name is Arjun Bardwaj from Corpus Christi College, and I'm the Chief of Staff at the Oxford Union. It is truly a privilege to be hosting Martin at the Oxford Union today. So, coming up next, we have Martin Tyler. And it's, it's live. live! Thank you, Martin. The floor is yours. Well, thank you. Um, listening to the other great people you've got coming on, I feel very humble to be your guest this evening, but it, it is a real pleasure. I've known about uh, what you've been doing for years and years, and I actually know some people, of course, who've spoken at the Oxford Union, but this is, it's a pleasure, and I'll say a few words now and take as many questions as we can squeeze in. Um, when people ask me what I do, don't know what I do, and maybe there's some people part of this tonight don't know, I say, I shout goal for a living. And that's basically what I've done for the last over 45 years, really. Um, very grateful to Sky Sports, who put up with me for 30, the last 30 years, and before that ITV, where I learned my trade, really. And also, I work for the Premier League, I've worked for the FA, and I've done quite a lot of work for Australia, if there are any Australians in the audience for SBS who've allowed me to commentate on the major international tournaments that uh, Sky Sports haven't had the, uh, the rights, the television rights for. Um, it, it's a pretty simple job really with the complications that whatever you say, whether it's right or wrong in the social media world, somebody's gonna say something usually adverse about it, but you develop a thick skin and, and you get on with it. Um, and I thought before we interact really, I'd tell you what my main principles of commentating are. I call them the three eyes because to be honest, you need a third eye to be able to do the job properly. You're trying to do something aiming for perfection that you just can't achieve. So I'm still aiming and I'm still not achieving. But the um, the first I, different eyes, of course, I being the letter, the three eyes, is identification. It's very important to identify the players correctly. It used to be um, quite a study, to be honest with you, because uh, I started before the age of video recorders, let alone all the, um, the different channels that you can record these days or you can watch. Um, so uh, the commentators of that time, first and foremost, I got some advice from John Motson, who was, uh, was a little bit older than me and had had a really rapid start to his career on BBC television. Before my very first game, he sent me a telegram. Most of you don't even know what telegrams are, um, but it, it's a message that got delivered through the door. And on it, it said, talk little, but say a lot. And I thought that was great advice. Somewhere in this chaotic office, I've still got the actual telegram itself. I, I was very grateful to John for sending it. It was very good advice at the time. Um, maybe it's a bit different now. We seem to talk a lot. If I don't talk for about 15 or 20 seconds, the director in my ear is going, oh, we've lost Martin's microphone. Uh, there's a sound problem. Uh, they do expect a lot more output that probably was the case when I started. But the identification of the players is still the same principle as it was when I started. You've got to get the the names right to the right incidents in crowded penalty areas, little flicks off uh, corner kicks that end up in the net. Was it an own goal or was it off a player? If so, which player? Those kind of things are um, really the tools of our trade to try and get that right. And it's you never go into a game without being concerned with those kind of incidents where there might be a goal that you can't call properly. And um, in the old days, you used to go and watch training to to, to talk to the players, meet the players. It was pretty open when I started. You could just phone up the club and say, look, I'm commentating. Can I come to watch and identify the players? Uh, and you need to do that because they weren't on the television all the time. There was no live football in the mid seventies when I started apart from international games and the cup final. Um, so that kind of privilege, I've been lucky as I've got older and people have known what I do. That I've been allowed that kind of access, but of course we haven't had it for I think I've talked to about three footballers in the flesh in the last 13 or 14 months. Probably they're grateful for that, but I'm certainly not um, because obviously we can't go to the training now and we have to do it remotely and we might come on to that later. But getting that identification is right. Um, I used to hang around the team hotels, anything to see the players and be able to just check they look like the photograph you might have got in a magazine. You wouldn't have seen them on the television. Now it's completely different. They're, they're all on the television now. There's game after game after game. I watched three live games here in my own house yesterday. So um, the, the access, the, the identification problem is a little bit easier, but it is the prime concern of a commentator to identify properly. Um, the second I is for information, um, which is the stats, really, the facts and figures of which there are 
I mean, they've just grown in abundance. So much data uh, now made available to the clubs themselves and obviously to the media as well. So what used to be a big a big coup, if you found out when someone's birthday on the big day, it's only going to Solskjaer's birthday today. And I'm doing Manchester United on Sunday, so he'll be 48 in two days. Is that worth a mention? You'll have to wait and see. I'm not sure. But if I was commentating today, it would be. Those kind of facts were hard to get um, in, in the time I started. But the skill, and it, it's, it's I've, even after all the years I've been doing it, the skill to get those information segments right in a live broadcast is very, very difficult. And what is right and what is wrong? Um, there was a goal the other day where I was talking about something else because the ball was with one goalkeeper, Edison of Manchester City. He strikes the ball 90 yards in a matter of seconds and Gundogan scores at the other end and I'm still halfway through the sentence about the, the information. And I, even after all these years, I go, oh, no, not again. Uh, I should know he could kick it 90 yards. So those kind of things happen. But I always tell this very quick story and it's an old one, so forgive me. Um, the story goes back to the 1980s when I was, um, my children were born. My, I've got a son and a daughter. They're both in their early 30s now. And uh, it was quite a, a big thing. And uh, obviously for any parent, but um, it was a part of my life that perhaps I didn't expect was going to happen. And it happened and it was wonderful. But I started talking to the players in the tunnel about their children, you know, and uh, Terry Butcher, who played for England, said, you've got to go to the birth, for example. That's not part of the story. But I, Gary Gillespie, who, if you watch if you're a Liverpool fan, you'll know who he is. If you watch Liverpool TV, he's on all the time as a pundit. He said, I've had four children and I delivered one of them myself. And I went, what? I've just been at the birth of one child. I thought, you delivered it? He said, yeah, we're in a hotel. I've been at the birth of two and I knew what to do. We couldn't get the midwife out. I thought, what a man. What, what a man. Be a new man now. But then it was unbelievable for him to do that. So I thought, oh, can I, can I, I want to pay him a compliment, get him into the commentary. And um, I thought, no, you can't go grubble our rolls the ball out to Alan Hansen that gives it to Gary Gillespie who delivered one of his children, by the way. You can't do that. So anyway, three years later, I think three, maybe even longer, Gary was playing for Scotland. And uh, I still got this information. Every time I saw Gary Gillespie play, I thought, what, what a guy. He actually did, did the midwife's job and one of his own kids. What, what, fantastic. Um, and uh, anyway, in this game against Poland, Scotland against Poland at Hamden, Gary Gillespie playing in the centre of defence. The ball goes over his shoulder. I'd probably be better demonstrating this, but we can't really understand. Went over his shoulder, and he's now facing his own goal, and Andy Gorham's the goalkeeper. Gary Gillespie, unaccountably, lobs the ball over his own goalkeeper. Own goal, Scotland own goal, Gillespie own goal. Scotland nil, Poland won, Gillespie own goal. So I said, having waited three and a half years, Look at this. There's a man panicking. This is Gary Gillespie panicking. He doesn't panic. I can tell you he was stuck in a hotel with a pregnant wife and he delivered his, one of his own children. There's a man who never panics and he's panicked and scored. That's my story about getting the information in, hopefully, the, at the right time. Um, and I wish I got a more up-to-date story to tell you that, and maybe one that's a bit more tasteful, but there you go. Uh, and the last one is interpretation, eye for interpretation, the third eye, which is really getting the facts and figures um, out of the way, but looking at the game and how the tactics are shaping up, who's pressing high, uh, who's dropping off a low block, as they call it now. Um, are they trying to get down one side of the pitch? Looking at, looking at the game. And if any of you think you would like to be uh, a broadcaster on football, I just finish off this little address with one piece of advice. The one piece of advice that I give to all aspiring commentators is watch the game. That sounds so simple. That's what you're paid to do. But I mean, watch it as it happens and look at it without your mind being cluttered up about what you think they're going to do. Um, I'm doing Chelsea Manchester United on on Sunday. We think Chelsea are going to play three defenders and not a back four, but they might play a back four. I've got to watch that and see that unfold. That's the interpretive side of the game. So those are my three eyes: identification, information, interpretation, and um, and the rest is a bit of bluff, really, I suppose. So <laughs> there we go. Um, but it's been a wonderful, a wonderful job, and I hope I can keep doing it for a little bit longer. And um, you'll tell me, maybe some of your questions will tell me whether I should be doing it a little bit longer or not. But uh, the plan is to keep going. And I, I know um, one or two people have uh, suggested that I'm probably defying time by doing I'm 75, 
but I've got a mind of a 19 year old really. And I hope that, that that's one thing. I, I feel young at heart and I try to be energetic. Uh, my partner always says to me, uh, she, she doesn't know the football ins and out, but she just says, your energy levels were good today. So that's important, I think. So I hope my energy levels are good for you guys, uh, your team. Uh, Jean, who have you got to ask me a question? Fantastic one. <laughs> Thank you very much for your opening remarks. Um, it was really interesting to hear about the three eyes in particular. Um, it'd be great to begin actually by discussing sort of the early stages of your commenting career, if possible. Um, we're all familiar with Martin Tyler, the commentator. But could you tell us a little more about Martin Tyler, the footballer? Um, you know, what was your experiences like playing football when you were younger? Well, I wanted to be a professional footballer, um, but there was very little coaching. Uh, I went to a school that had football one term, RGS Guildford, which was a state school, is now an independent school. Um, they had one term football and one term rugby, and I've been there two years and they cancelled the football. And I often think that's why, one, I don't like rugby, and two, I'm obsessed with football. Um, I tried, I played, uh, played for the old boys team when I was still at school, because that was the only way they couldn't play for the school, because they didn't have a team. Um, then I played in the Isthmian League. I went to university then and played for the university team, um, which took me to Cambridge, but not to Oxford. Um, we were in the Southern Universities League. I don't think Oxford and Cambridge participated in that. It was probably a bit lowbrow for them. We played Brighton, Sussex University, Bath, Bristol, um, Exeter, a lot of travelling, um, but a lot of fun. And uh, then I came out to, I graduated and came back to London and joined Corinthian Casuals, where there was a lot of connection with Oxford and Cambridge, because a lot of the best players who got blues came down and were wanting to play non-league football, and probably it fitted in better with their life choices in terms of their careers. So, and I made my debut for Corinthian Casuals against Oxford University in 1968. And we won 2-0. So uh, that's about the only connection I can drum up. <laughs> uh, and I played for five years. And then I got the, I was not getting very far with it. I was still playing at a reasonable level, but I wasn't a particularly good player. But I fought hard to, it's like everything. I, I'm, listening, I'm not here to give advice to people of your maturity and sensitivity. But if you really want to have a go at something, you know, give it your best shot. The hard part is learning out. It's learning what, what it is that you want to have a go at because you're all schooled for different careers through your subjects. But if that's not your real passion, use that as a stepping stone and try and follow what I've, I wanted to work in sport and work in football. And it can be done, whether it's in fashion or whether it's in music or art or anything that you think is a hobby. If you really love it, you will get a career out of it and a living out of it. And if you really love it, you'll win the competition for those places because you'll be the most determined and that's what I've been I was a very determined footballer but uh, and it got me that far but but no further I did keep playing I played in a lot of charity games I played at Oxford City against Bobby Moore when he was manager there in the old ground in Oxford City in the middle of Oxford and um, I played up front with Jim Rosenthal who worked for the Oxford Mail and became a distinguished broadcaster from that background um, and I finished playing in my mid 60s, really. I still I'm, I'm a system manager at Woking and I still I don't join in too much now. They, I, I remember the first time I realized they weren't passing to me. I was a liability. Happily, that was in my 60s, not in my 20s. Fantastic. And you originally started your media career, I believe, by writing columns and match reports. When did you decide that you wanted to go on air and how difficult was the transition? Well, these days it would be a lot easier. It, it would be, it, it would be dishonest to say it wasn't pretty lucky. Um, I worked when I was still playing. I got a job, a journalistic job on a what they call a part work. You collect it. I've got they're all up on the shelves here. I uh, collect um, a weekly magazine, but you kept it in a binder and you built it up like an encyclopedia of football. Really, it was called Book of Football, and that was Monday to Friday. So I worked on that. Um, my first day was, uh, <laughs> it was May, I think May the 1st, 1971, so we're coming around to 50 years, which is terrifying, and Arsenal won the league at Spurs that night, and all the guys from the office that I just joined went to the game. I was training, I think, so we were still playing, and on the following Saturday, Arsenal won the cup and completed the double, so that was, it was quite an interesting first week in, in sort of journalism. Um, and I'm, 
working there, I met some people in television. They gave me um, help. I could, you couldn't record any football. So to watch it, you had to go to a television studio if it had happened. So there was no way of keeping in your own house. Uh, there was no even VHS or Betamax and that sort of stuff. The old stuff hadn't been invented then. So we used to go to the studios about once a month and they'd give us like 15 minutes to look at things we wanted to use for the magazine, goals, how they were scored, different kinds of free kicks over the wall, um, you know, through passes, different, all the top players, but we had to, and I took an artist in with me. Anyway, I got to know the people there. And when the part were finished, because it had a shelf life of like 80 episodes, I think, and uh, 80 editions, um, I got a call saying, um, would you like to come and work for us? The TV, not as a broadcaster, but just as an editorial person. And I said no, because I wanted to play. Um, but in that time, I was working for a, a guy that, if you don't know him, you should look him up because he had a massive influence on football, a guy called Jimmy Hill, um, who was a big television personality, both for ITV and then for, he was one of the early presenters of Match of the Day as well. Well, he was a football manager, football player, uh, chairman of the PFA, got rid of the maximum wage. He was an amazing person, really charismatic person. And he was short of somebody to ghost a column for him in the Sunday papers. So I used to write this column for him. And just as fate, I mean, luck has to play a part in whatever life uh, is in store for all you guys, is that um, he was there. I used to write the copy longhand um, and push it through his letterbox in uh, Notting Hill in London um, and one day I put it through letterbox and he was there he said come in and have a cup of coffee what are you doing I said oh I'm doing this and I'm doing pre-season he said oh but I said by the way I've been offered a job in television and he went yes and I went no I've turned it down um, and he said his very words were I'll never forget them you're mad you never know where it might lead you well, he's no longer with us, but he'd be very proud that it's led me to the Oxford Union, I can tell you that. Um, so I went home, literally went home, phoned up again, says the job still open. And then and they said, yeah, you be, yeah, I think so. Come in. So I came in on a trial, got it. But I had to go to the football club and say, I'm sorry, I'm not available anymore. And the, you know your cricket, Arjun. The, um, the manager I was playing for uh, is... He's still, he's still, he's in his 80s now. Um, he was the football manager then, but a very famous cricket manager and player called Mickey Stewart, who was the father of Alex Stewart, who's still very much on the Surrey circuit now as a coach. And Mickey said, I went to, I, I went to, I said, boss, look, I'm sorry, I'm doing the pre-season, but I'm not going to be able to play, I'm going into television. And he looked me in the eye and I thought, please say, do you want me to stay? And he went, good luck, son. And that was it. I turned on my heels <laughs> and walked into television. A year later, I got the chance to come and say, I was nowhere near. They didn't want, they had no idea that I'd become a broadcaster. I had no idea I'd become a broadcaster. But I wanted to get back out of the studio, which the job was, back to the football grounds on a Saturday afternoon. And it, it seemed a decent way to do it. And I, a, a chance, I did a couple of test tapes and then a job came up for one game. And amazingly, I got it. And... Um, that was December 1974, it's a hell of a long time ago. But I do remember every detail of it, as you might imagine. And you mentioned your then career began at ITV, but eventually you made a switch to Sky Sports. What was the main motivation behind the move? And what was the biggest challenges you faced in the transition? It's a really good question. The main motivation was to get more games, I think. I was, I'd done, um, some big games for ITV in the 80s, like the England games, because Brian Moore, who was the number one commentator, he was the presenter of World Cups. He stayed in London and did the studio and was a brilliant journalist, as well as a commentator and a great presenter. So I got to do the 82 World Cup, which England did OK and didn't lose a game. And then I did the 86 World Cup in which Maradona did that. And uh, I was in the ground for that. Uh, but I wasn't getting much in between. And so I got this opportunity. I'm sure I wasn't first choice. I'm absolutely sure I wasn't first choice, but I was probably the one, I had known Andy Gray from, I'd done a commentary with him while he was still playing for a match at Wembley. And I don't know, maybe they got to ask Andy in the end, who was employed by, it was before Sky Sports, it was called British Satellite Broadcasting, and BSB as opposed to B Sky B. And we got, um, 
yeah, I got a call saying, do you want to come? And I mean, I, I was under contract to ITV for a, a little bit longer. So I had to go and ask for my release, um, which <laughs> rather like the football manager, they gave me very easily. But I think it was, you know, I had almost 20 years experience. It was, the, and, and Sky needed somebody with some experience, but we didn't know the Premier League. I didn't join for the Premier League. The Premier League fell into our laps, really. Um, and I was there on the first day. Um, I did the first live game for Sky, which was Nottingham Forest 1, Liverpool 0 um, in August 1992. And here we are getting on for 30 years later and it, it's whizzed by. Um, the differences have been considerable, obviously, um, with the technology, with the fact we had to convince the country that sports channels were the way to go. Everybody said too much live football would kill football. It's just been the opposite, actually, although we've had a lot now for different reasons, of course. And I think everybody wants to get back to a slightly more balanced um, broadcasting approach. Um, you can't watch everything, but you can give people the opportunity to watch everything. And that's what didn't happen before. The job itself is still exactly the same. Identification, information, <laughs> interpretation. It's exactly the same. But when I did my first game, we had four cameras on the game. Now we have 24 and more. And you mentioned the three eyes sort of staying a common feature. How has your preparation, um, sort of preparing to commentate on a match, how's that changed over the years? As you know, we've had more access to statistics and other sort of data analysis. I think the hard thing is to find something that's not been said already. I mean, even for the co-commentator, the Gary Nevels and Jamie Carriers, they're listening to what's being said in the studio beforehand. We always have a little sequence after the ad it's live, which now is at the end of the team captions, where the co-commentator picks up a couple of close-ups and they would go, um, I'm trying to think what happened the other day. Um, Kevin De Bruyne came back, didn't he? The, the, Gary wanted to talk about Kevin De Bruyne, but they talked about him in the studio. So there's so much that you have to, you're, we're the last ones on. So we have to try and have things that are different and you don't want to keep them away from everybody else because you know, that's, that's not right. We're a team. And that, that's one thing I did want to say today. Television is a wonderful team game. And although people know what I do, um, the people that make it tick are the engineers, the sound men, the directors and the producers. And it is television. You could manage without the voice, to be honest, but you can't manage without the pictures. So the people that produce the pictures are the, are the key people. Um, so in terms of the prep, it's more, you dig deeper. There's more um, tools to dig deeper. The shovels are sharper, if you like. And you, um, you end up um, wondering what's gonna be the headline in the paper like on Sunday. <laughs> what, I don't mind repeating stuff, but you do like to have one or two little things that, that could be you know, fresh for the viewer. You, you, you really try to be in that sense. And that's what I mentioned to you earlier, Ashton, about not being able to talk to the players. I mean, it's great fun to meet the players in the tunnel and say, and I remember Robbie Savage saying to me, um, if it's Blackburn v Manchester United, Robbie Savage, who's well known now to, as a TV pundit as well. Um, I said, I've been, Robbie said, we moved house yesterday. And I thought, oh, that's nice. And uh, he said, yeah, I've moved in next to Alec Ferguson. They're playing Man United. <laughs> so, so I said, do you mind if I use that? He said, no. He said, I'd be looking over the wall and all this stuff. And, and so I thought that was, that was something fresh to tell you. Hey, it's Robbie Savage, you know, Blackburn midfield, hard tackling. And by the way, Alec Ferguson will see, me, I see a lot more of him than just tonight because they're next door neighbours as from today. So that kind of stuff I like doing. I like that kind of, if you like, trivia. Um, and it's hard to get it to be honest, because everybody else is searching. Well, there's some wonderful journalism out there now. Um, but it's a nice field to be in still, and I'm, I'm certainly enjoying the challenge still. And just building on that, you mentioned the importance of teamwork in sort of a successful broadcast. I imagine having a good relationship with your co-commentators off-air is key to ensuring the excellent chemistry and smooth broadcast we hear. What is your relationship like with your co-commentators off the air? How do you ensure you get that natural sort of banter and uh, sort of smooth flowing in the actual broadcast? I think the, the banter is there in, in it's easy at football, it's football talk really. I think the hard part, the disciplined part is to keep it in its proper place. It'd be very easy to have lots of gags going through and in jokes if you like. And I'm very aware that I have a responsibility that, that not everybody is uh, on that wavelength, that not every, every viewer, every listener. 
but I mean, at my age, it's like taking the kids to a game, to be honest with you. Um, certainly Gary and Jamie, when they're together, um, it, it's hilarious. I know that I haven't got that much work to do because they carry it all through. And, but sometimes you have to go, it's almost like they, they when say, um, are we there yet, Dad? You know, it's that kind of backseat of the car stuff. <laughs> they sort of look at me as the, the, not the guiding light, but the one that might get them out of a jam if they find themselves in one, but they don't, they're very good. But with every, I really, really enjoy working with all, all the football commentators, co-commentators I've had down the years have been, been tens, maybe hundreds I, 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 since it started. It wasn't like that when I started, you didn't have a co-commentator, but um, very soon it came in and I'm delighted because it's, it's a better experience shared, you know? Definitely. And if you had to pick, so if who's been your favourite co-commentator to work with over your time as a, as a commentator? Is there someone you particularly enjoy co-commentating with more than others? Have you got children? <laughs> uh, no. Well, when you have, you'll understand the answer. You don't have a favourite child. Fantastic. <laughs> um, <laughs> Um, just a quick question is, you, we see a lot of footballers um, have pre-match rituals, such as, you know, touching the pitch or little different <laughs> superstitions. Do you have one before you go on air? No, just getting there is important. I mean, that's the worst thing. I still have nightmares about, I had one the other night about not getting to West Ham because I live near the M25, you know, the people don't know the big circular road around the outskirts of London. And... I was late in my dream. I was late for this game at West Ham, but I was having a driver pick me up. And I said to the driver, we'll go around the M25 because it's quick and we'll make up the time. And he said, no, no, I've got to go in through London. We've got to pick some people up on the way. And I go, no, no, I'll be late. I'll be late. And um, I, in, in my dream, I missed the game. Um, and nobody, and I was thinking, nobody's phoned me to say where I am. So, you know, this is it seemed very strange, but that's the fear, I mean, once I got stuck after a hurricane had blown trees down on the M25 actually. And I had to, I think the statute of limitations, I'm all right to admit this, but I had to go up the hard shoulder <laughs> um, in stationary traffic to get to the next junction. And it was horrendous. And my colleagues, you talk about banter, my colleagues were phoning, so pretending to be the police in various areas that they knew I was traveling through. Um, and I got there for a four o'clock kickoff at about 10 past two. And you might think that's plenty of time, but I normally get there three or four hours before, four hours usually before the game. And um, I never quite got it right. I never felt right during the commentary. So that and eating, as, as you get older, you have to eat. Um, there's nothing worse than starting the second half with that hollow feeling in your stomach, knowing you've got another best part of an hour's broadcast to go and you, you can't really eat because you can't snatch a a bike during a, during a half of football, really, in case you, you'd be gurgling down. A, a goal would happen within your mouthful and, and that would be the end of you, really. So, uh, so that, those are the two things. Get there, make, get there safely. Um, of course, we have some safety checks now to go through, health checks like everybody else is working. And I must add to this, at the time we're speaking, that the privilege of being allowed to go to games is enormous. I do feel I'm representing the whole fan base and all the other commentators do too. We thought when the restart happened in June that we'd be doing it off the monitor, which does happen, as you know, European games are being done like that now. Um, people aren't traveling, but we've been allowed to go. We have to travel on our own. We have to obey certain restrictions, but um, it's nothing like the restrictions that people aren't allowed to go, have to go through. So. We're very, very lucky and I'm very grateful and I can only compliment the Premier League um, and the other authorities for making it happen. Um, and I hope it's not quite the same. I think everybody would agree with that, but it's uh, it's not that far off. And I think it's been well worth the effort that's gone into it. Um, but we're all aching for the day when we can let the crowd roll and do the rest, you know. Definitely. And without fans now at the stadium, you sort of see the role of a commentator as having changed. How difficult has it been to adjust to that sort of eerie silence? Well, we do get the, um, um, Arjun, we do get the uh, extra crowd, um, the augmented crowd. So we can choose whether we want to hear that or not. And I must say it's been very good because it's been ground specific. So you do hear, if, whichever team you follow, you, if, you, if you're following Chelsea, for example, you'll hear Chelsea support on the augmented 
um, which is obviously not live effects. Um, I, I do use those because I think it's the right, um, it gives, gives you a lift to your voice, you know. Um, but it's, yeah, it's a little bit harder, but these are difficulties that you would certainly not want to not do it for, if you see what I mean. They're, they're not deal breakers because what I just said to you now, the, the oh, privilege of being able to go is, is amazing, really, because I don't know, I found it really hard personally between uh, March and June when we weren't having any football at all. Um, so it, it's, it's, it's been a godsend, to be honest. And I know I'm, I'm very lucky and everybody who goes, I promise you, feels the same. So we're trying to do it. Um, if you feel the football's not quite the same, probably the commentary's not quite the same. I think the one thing about it is we feel we're commentating like to the fans of the two clubs because not everybody can watch all the games now. You, we had a massive viewing figures, Liverpool, Manchester City recently. And so, you know, you've got the key audience of all the football supporters, the Sky audience, if you like. But um, some games you'll, you'll realise that um, might be the kickoff time or might be just nature of the two teams that are not quite so commercial that you've got a, you might be doing a game with just the supporters of the two teams which is not normal so but you, you get used to it and you you try your hardest to do what we we all try to do is give a balanced account of and an accurate account of what's going on over the course of your career you've commented on some of the most memorable moments in the history of the sport in 2009 i think you described arsenal's invincibles as the greatest premier league moment of the previous decade do you think any one moment has usurped that since? Well, I, I said it's the greatest achievement, I think. The greatest achievement, actually. Um, I think Alan Shearer's 260 goals, Arsenal invincible, and Leicester City winning the league in 2016 are fantastic achievements. If you're looking for a moment, then that might be a different answer. But the actual, uh, I'm a great believer, I, I would be, wouldn't I, I've done 45 years in the same job. I'm a great believer of the sustainability equaling um, some sort of satisfaction, you know, that, that um, to keep doing it, repeat, repeat, repeat. I've just been listening to Thomas Tuchel say repetition is the key to developing his players, his teamwork. And uh, I think to be able to, um, to go out and perform at that level as, as, as Alan Shearer did with the goals and any of those who've got really high stat Ryan Giggs with the appearances, Gareth Barry, you know, amazing to keep doing that week in, with all the difficulties, the occupational hazards, the injuries, uh, the, the whims of selection from di different managers. So um, I think, that, but um, there have been moments that obviously stand um, stand alone in a different category, if you don't mind me saying so. Uh, absolutely. And I think, could you talk us through one of those moments, which I think we have to talk about the final day of the 2011-12 Premier League season in your famous Aguero moment. Could you talk through us a bit, you know, the ending of that match and sort of how you felt and how you managed to keep your focus on the commentating as well? Well, let me say first and foremost, it is Sergio Aguero's moment. It is Manchester City's moment. It is Edin Dzeko's moment because he scored the goal that's always forgotten, the equaliser, because as I said at one point, I think City need two goals in added time, two goals, not one. So that was a big part of it that gets overlooked. I also should mention the match director, a guy called Tony Mills, who produced an extraordinary array of shots, visuals, Joe Hart running around like uh, like somebody totally out of control, not knowing exactly what had happened, how we knew what had happened, but how it had happened and when it had happened. And um, it, it's an amazing piece of television. And the visual side of it is, is extraordinary because we were covering both games on the day. The other game was some of the Manchester United who were going to win the league if Manchester City didn't win their match. And Tony had got, you couldn't have post-produced it better than Tony did it live where we had the split screen, there were the Manchester United players looking at our monitors, they'd won, they'd done their job, and watching on our monitors up at the Stadium of Light, what was happening in front of me in the, uh, in the Etihad Stadium. And, and that split screen came out to the one screen of Manchester City as Balotelli reached for the ball and actually got his only accredited assist in his time in the Premier League. <laughs> That's another story, but uh, he 
flicked it forward and, and obviously Sergio did the rest. Um, for me, I think the, I suppose the years of loving football and watching football, it wasn't too difficult to decipher the drama from everything else that it was, and I still stand by it, I swear you'll never see anything like it ever again. Um, and I knew, the, I've said this several times, forgive me if you've heard it before, but when he took a touch, I knew he'd score, which is slightly earlier than perhaps, you know, you might feel that. So whether I feel my lungs or whatever, I don't know. But I've had most compliments for the silence between the last O of Aguero <laughs> and the next comment. Um, but there is a reason for that. Um, it wasn't a reason I was aware of at the time, but it was the reason. Uh, Mark Hughes was manager of Queen's Park Rangers, the team that actually, they were a winner in the sense they stayed up and again, we lost the game on this goal. He said, and he'd played for Manchester United for years, for Bayern Munich, for Barcelona, for Wales in big matches, managed Wales, managed clubs, all sorts of levels. He said it was the noisiest moment in a football ground that he'd ever heard, ever. And I thought, well, that's fair enough. There was no point in my little larynx trying to have a go at trying to you know, cut across that. So... It was, I mean, I've been doing the job, what, what was it, 2012, 38 years, something like that. And I suppose I was due one of those moments. There haven't been that many of them. And we don't choose where we're sent. We're sent to games, you know? So it's the, it's the luck of the draw, really. Um, but I suppose, yeah, I listen to it now and it's some other bloke doing it, but it has an effect on me as well as a viewer. So... As one of my good friends said to me afterwards, at least you didn't mess it up, but he didn't use the word mess. And aside from that match, which has obviously gone down in history for so many reasons, what was the best match you've ever commentated on? If you could just pick maybe one or two that you've enjoyed the most. I pick one because I, I, I've got one. I've got one for you, which is I've been consistent to it. And I saw it back in lockdown one. Uh, Sky did these retro games and it was Liverpool 4, Newcastle 3 from 1996. And I was a little bit worried because I've been saying since, pretty much since then, and actually when I heard the commentary again, I said it during the match that this is a candidate for being the best game. Um, uh, and so I thought well, all these years later, but my son who'd never seen it, he, he uh, watched it at his house and uh, I said, come on, you tell me honestly what you think. And he he, he said, oh, it's the best game I've ever seen. So I stick with it. It was, both teams were going for the title. It was in the April, both teams were going for the title. Neither won it. And it went from Liverpool scoring after a couple of minutes, Robbie Fowler, through Liverpool, then lost, the, they were 1-1. And Liverpool didn't lead again until Stan Collymore scored his second goal in stoppage time. And it had all that, you know, if, you, if you wanted to turn what you feel about football into a product, into something you could sell over the counter, that had all the elements of it. It was just gripping. Both teams went for it. The goals were fantastic. Collymore to Fowler to Ginola, Ferdinand, Tino Espria. And again, I, I'll tell you a very quick story that, that, that um, at the end of, um, the game, obviously, everybody said it was amazing and went off separate ways. Fast forward to 2014, this is 1996, so 18 years later, yeah. Um, opening game of the Brazil World Cup in Sao Paulo. I'm going up to the commentary position with Stan Collymore, who scored the winning goal and another goal as well. And we, he's working for Talk Sport. So we got to the lift op doors open on the floor where the commentary positions are staring us in the face is Tino Espria who couldn't have known that we were coming or that he didn't really relate to me but he looked at Stan Collymore and said you cost me my Premier League winner's medal 18 years later he hardly speaks any English <laughs> and that came out and, and it resonated with everybody and uh, I, I was lucky enough to share that moment it just reminded me again what great so lots of games to come that close to it but I'm glad I've got one because I get asked a lot about best this best that that for me remains and it was delivered from what i regarded as the best gantry television gantry in the world the old liverpool gantry which is not there anymore sadly but i was lucky enough to use many times before they built a bigger stand and a gantry that's further away from the pitch 
Just looking at this current season then, what team have you enjoyed commentating on most this Premier League season? Well, Leeds United have obviously been a new element to it and the energy of their team is extraordinary. Um, they, they come at you, they play with lack of fear and they do all this without any fans. So uh, I worked for Yorkshire Television for five years, a long time ago, 76 to 81. And Leeds were in decline after the great Don Revie period after that. And they got actually got relegated out of the old first division the year after I left, 82. Um, and I haven't done many Leeds games in the Premier League since obviously they were relegated. When they got back to the Premier League, they were then relegated in 2004. So to go back and see them was quite nostalgic for me, but they've, they've been a great watch, um, uninhibited and different. And I think it's hard to find different after all these years, but uh, the principles of football are very much the same. You know, there's two goals, you've got to put the ball in it. And you know, the goal you're attacking, keep the ball out of the goal you're defending. It's, a, it's whatever way you go about it, that's, that's what you've got to do. And um, so I, I, I would put them, but, to be honest with you, I enjoy every game. I, I wouldn't be doing it, would I, if I, I didn't? I, I'm so lucky to be asked to still do it. But it's just a, just a pleasure to sit there and with a bit of information as to maybe how one team's going to play and how the other team's going to play so that you can watch it all unfold, the strategy of it. Um, it's, a, it's a stunning game. It's a beautiful game, as the cliche says. Um, and if you're... In that fraternity, you understand what I'm saying. But I, I am well aware. I mean, a couple of times in, I was allowed out of lockdown to go and get my food in, in, um, in say April. And I thought, this is what people do on Saturday afternoons. Then, you know, I'm in my seventies and I've never done that. I've never been shopping on a Saturday afternoon. I've always been at football. Um, so I do realise there's a whole world out there where it means next to nothing to be honest and there'd be next to negative thoughts as well but for me um as a as a fan as a player as a commentator as a coach now as well it's been just a joyous way of life and occasionally we've had time to think haven't we a lot i think would i have changed any of it would i have done something different there are things that i would like to have expanded to do find time found time to do i'm, I'm not totally disinterested in everything else but um, the fellowship the friendship and the sheer fun of it has been breathtaking I don't know what I've done to deserve it to be honest with you um, just a few more questions um, from me quickly before we move on to the audience q and um, I just wanted to ask quickly about VAR do you find that VAR has sort of changed the way you have to commentate sort of being slightly more measured perhaps when you sort of see a goal go in well, how has it sort of impacted your role as a commentator? That certainly was the subject of discussion when we started, and VAR started. Am I never going to shout goal again? <laughs> you know, I mean, say, so, well, it, it's in the net, but let's see what they... But I think we soon realised that it doesn't matter if you say it's a great goal and it's not, because everybody understands it. The players on the field are celebrating, people back home are celebrating, but we, we know that there's another check on it. Um, I think embracing change is very important, particularly when you've been around as long as me, is if you seem like a stick in the mud, I don't think that's a very good um, uh, coat to wear, to be honest with you. So I would, I would always embrace it. I think it, it, it was always going to take longer than people thought. And the way it's been now, it's getting better. Um, it's still unfulfilling sometimes. But for example, last weekend, Jesse Lingard for playing for West Ham got a goal that would have been ruled out offside. You do get something back from it. It's easy to emphasize the negatives. We're losing, oh, he's offside by that much and the line shows it. Um, I think in matters of fact, we have to go with the matters of fact. I know personally a lot of the referees, I know they're doing their very best with it. And they, they would rather be out in the middle than doing it in Stockley Park, I think, but they, that has to be done. So I would say give it a couple more years and hopefully it'll get to a point. The next gen, you know, when I, I'm trying to think what happened when I, 
I mean, the, the boots changed, the football changed. Um, going back for that, the offside law changed. Um, you know, going right back, there were no goal nets and things have moved on, you know. Now the football is being considered with, with issues with health and safety and dementia and Alzheimer's. So all these things have their time. And I think we live in a technological age. So it's the time to try VAR. It won't be for me to judge whether it's right or wrong. Those who make the decisions about the and, and to be honest, your generation will judge because if you don't like football as much as my generation, the game will go like that. And it, they, they, those who run the game can't allow that to happen. So let, let's see, and, and you, you, you'll be much more able to deal with it instinctively probably than me, but I have to learn it and I'm trying to learn it that, yes, I go, well, there'll be a check. <laughs> and then we all hold our breath, don't we? Fantastic. I think I'm now going to turn to some audience questions because we've had a lot come in through the chat function and I'd encourage um, everyone to keep submitting their questions. The first question comes from Ed Martin, who asks, what has been the hardest surname you've had to deal with? Um, well, obviously, there are a lot of uh, foreign names at the moment and have been many more foreign names. The Polish names are quite difficult. They seem to be a bit short on vowels. But um, you, actually, when you find out, finding out how they should be said is the hard part. Um, Shoratire is spelt Shortire. He's Manchester United's new starlet. It's spelt S H O R E Shore T I R E Tire. It's Shoratire. I have to find that out. He might play on Sunday in the game. And fortunately, with all the good technology that I told you about, um, we're good at that. I think getting it right is the most important thing. But there are some players who, who change what, <laughs> what they want to be called. I can tell you when I, a long, long time ago, I worked at Yorkshire Television, I told you earlier, in Sheffield, it was always very cold in the winter, but the games were always on. They were very keen. They always played through the elements. And they had a player called Alan Woodward. And saying Woodward with very cold lips, once I said wood, 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 like that, and like about five woods, I've always remembered that that was one that um, uh, defied my abilities at the time. But that's the job of the commentator. And some commentators like anglicizing it and some don't. And what I don't like is to have an industry where I call somebody one thing and somebody else calls them another thing. And the viewer goes, well, what's, you know, what, what's the answer here? And we can't always agree. On, on these things. So, for example, it's Christian Pulisic and nobody calls him that, but that's, I try to. And that, if he scores the winner for Chelsea, I know there'll be some people watching this, uh, uh, this Zoom call who'll be very happy <laughs> and they won't mind how I pronounce it if he scores the winner, but they're little, they're little nuances. So um, it's a good question and it's something that it, it, it is a bit like an injury for a footballer. It's an occupational hazard for the commentator. We've had a lot of questions come in actually about your role in the FIFA video games. Um, would you sort of be able to talk about your experiences working with FIFA and how that sort of worked? Well, it's finished now and I had a wonderful run of 15 years doing it and quite rightly they wanted to make a change and so I would have loved to have carried on. I respect their right to do that. Um, it's done by imagination really and the information that they pass on to us is it's a free kick into the top corner so you you have to imagine it, visualize it and give, uh, oh, he's put it in the top corner. Oh, brilliant effort, couldn't have placed it better. Um, that's a couple. And then they'd say do another three or four more and you just do things like that. But I always thought it was harder for the co-commentator, it was Alan Smith for many years alongside me, um, because I've said where it's gone. What more can they say? There's nothing else that's in, we don't see anything. To be fair, we did do a series where we did see some pictures um, and that made it a lot easier for, for all of us but mostly it was just off script and the hard part was um, at one point you'd get to the near the end and they'd say right you've got to do the, the names and there'd be 52 sheets of names and you'd have to go um, I, I, I think for you for, for a Chelsea fan um, you'd have to go uh, Abraham 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 and you do that with 1,500, 2,000 names for a day. Um, so that was, that's the kind of thing you did, I did 
but I, I did enjoy doing it. And the skill was to make it sound as near lifelike as possible. And it's up to, I, I wasn't very good at playing it. I, when, when I started on it, I played every every new game, but I soon realized I was useless. So um, uh, my son just beat me every time. In the first game, I, I, I'd always score first and always lose 5-1. So um, only, uh, only the questioner would know whether we reached our target in terms of making it sound properly. Our next question comes from Mauricio, who asks whether you rehearse any of your lines before and that. Are there some set phrases um, you have would you try and incorporate into your broadcast? No, it's a, a question I, I'm glad you asked um, because you could tell. I mean, maybe something comes over as sound as though it's the one thing we do right um, is the team news because if you know that this is what we call a reveal, um, we get the goalkeeper, we get the manager, and then the goalkeeper, and then the back three or four and midfield, and, and it has to be done in a certain um, uh, short amount of time to be honest with you so that is red and that leads now to and it's live at the end so that in a way is red too <laughs> but for the rest now it's um it's improv as my actress actor daughter would say um our next question is from julian who asks whether you find it difficult to commentate on a game in which you might favor one of the teams perhaps when you commentate on england for example um it, it, it's not as difficult as it sounds. I mean, I would like England to, I would say the one line I've never said is England have won the World Cup and I'm running out of time. <laughs> I thought it might have happened last time, you know, I really did. But um, no, you, it, the two things, I, I'm a working fan, I've been all my life. I've done maybe seven or eight working games in different circumstances. Once they're on the field, they're a different, they're just a team and against a team. Um, I know people think, and I, I'm not on social media, but I know people think, oh, he's biased for this and biased for that. And when you do games like the Merseyside Derby, which I did recently, you know that there'll be people saying, oh, you support this team, you support that team. I promise I don't. Um, and England's probably the nearest thing to it. I but I always want the better team to win, you know? I think that's something that, that sport teaches you. I don't like... Um, you know, I was thinking the other day about Maradona and the, and the punch goal, and I thought you might somebody might ask me about it today. And it helped win a game, and it's a brutal results business. If I was 20 years old starting out as young footballer and scored the winning goal by punching it, I probably would go, oh, well, that's the game. But as I've got older and I've seen life, a bit more of life, as a coach now, I'm a, we've got a big FA Trophy game coming up at Woking. If one of our players won the game by punching into the net, it would mean nothing to me. I wouldn't take any pleasure from it whatsoever. So um, I think fairness and if if a team deserves to well and deserves to win, plays well and beats England, well played. That's that's the way I look at it. So it's not as difficult as it seems. And if I can do Woking without feeling it, then I could certainly do England. <laughs> We've had a, a couple of questions along the same theme asked by Joe and Alex Allencar about your favourite stadiums to commentate in. You mentioned Liverpool purely from the sort of gantry perspective, but in terms of the overall atmosphere and just the feel of the stadium, um, what have been the highlights for you? I think it's the big, it's the size of the game really, as much as the size of the stadium, you know. As a, as a broadcaster, you want to be on the, the biggest games that the, that the company can allocate you to. Um, I been lucky enough to do pretty much all the World Cups since 78, it's a long time ago. Um, and the games in Argentina in 78 were amazing. I did the game where they beat Peru 6-0 to get to the final. The whole country went crazy. Um, it's that kind of reaction. And it just emphasise again what we're missing by not allowing the passion for the game to come through. For, right, for good reasons, I understand that. Um, but that the the commentary positions do help. Yeah, uh, Liverpool was very good. Um, Crystal Palace is very good now. I've got a Crystal Palace game coming up. That's very that's very much like what the Liverpool one used to be at Selhurst Park. Um, but the bigger the grounds, the further away we're put, um, and that's fair enough. You know, I mean, the broadcasters pay a lot of money, but there are sponsors who should have the the very best seats, and it's up to us to solve our problems. You know. We're, I will always try and get the best commentary position I can. 
and sometimes that's involved uh, the odd altercation with the uh, um, the ground staff who think you can't sit there when you when you really would like to and you could. Um, but I, I think I've got to a stage now. I'm just pleased to be asked, Arjun, to be honest with you. If I get when I left my first game in 1974, the producer who was quite a well-to-do gentleman, not really a football man. He said, um, so it was my first ever game. And he said, well, old boy, well, well done, old boy. We've got another game in a couple of weeks. Would you like to do that? And my reply to your question is, really, ever since then, people have been saying, we've got another game. Would you like to do that? And while they're still saying that, then whichever ground it is, I'm thrilled to go to, to be honest. Fantastic. I think we've got time for just one last question, which comes from Robert Wright asking, will there be another team like Nottingham Forest in 1979 and 80, a team that was just simply made and not bought? I hope so. Um, things have changed a lot since then. I think the Leicester City experience showed that the underdog can do that. Um, and there were some players bought for Forest. One of them, Trevor Francis, was bought at quite, uh, quite an expensive fee. But I know uh, it's the, the homegrownness of it, really. But we are seeing a lot. I mean, Manchester United, I heard um, a fellow commentator say that they've had an academy graduate in the squad since 1937 or something like that. 4,000 games has been only. And uh, the last game that they played that I watched against the Sociedad, which is before our Chelsea game that we're doing at the, the weekend. Obviously, this will be watched at a later date, but we're giving you some context of it. Um, that, um, uh, that they had five or six on the field at the end of the Real Sociedad game. So there are clubs that are trying to, Chelsea are now starting to you know, give the, the youngsters, their homegrown youngsters, the, their wings to fly in the first team. So I hope um, it, is, it is nice, even as a coach at Woking, we've got a couple of local lads coming through our academy and it's a bit of a buzz to do it and, and to build a team but we have paid the princely sum of £10,000 for our latest centre-half, so even we buy something. It is the way of the world. I mean, football reflects the way of the world. Uh, the business side of football is, is because the world is now very heavily business-loaded, um, and that has changed a massive amount from when I started, when there was one sub, a chief, chief executive had never been heard of, you had a football secretary, a manager, a trainer, a physio with a sponge, and... And off you go and play. The, the thing that is the same is it's 11 against 11. The dimensions of the pitch haven't changed. Maybe winning's got more important, which perhaps is a consequence of life in life. Succeeding's got more important. But it's a great game. And I'm so glad that your generation, and that's why it's lovely to listen to these questions and, and talk to you and say thank you very much for inviting me because uh, carry on. There's the baton. You run with it. Well, thank you very much for taking the time to speak with us today. Unfortunately, that's all we have time for. But it was a fascinating conversation and we're truly privileged to have hosted you today. Thank you very much. My pleasure, I promise you.